You're listening to Checking In, a self-help book club hosted by Adam and Amber, where we read self-help books each week and sit down to talk about them. Disclaimer, the opinions recorded on this podcast are our own and do not reflect the authors mentioned here. (coughs) Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast. I didn't mean to cough. I didn't mean to spill water on the floor. (laughs) One one for each of us. (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to leave all of that in. <laughs> How are y'all doing? Everybody just, woo! Who is y'all? <laughs> it's just me sitting here. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I suddenly have delusions of an audience. Uh, let's start like this. Um, do you have oh God. fear of abandonment? Yes. Uh, unstable relationships. Some could say that. Unclear or shifting self-image. Uh, I think Imp- it's pretty clear. <laughs> <laughs> Impulsive, self-destructive behaviors. No. Self-harm. Mm. So there's our implied trigger warning, actually. <laughs> <clears throat> Extreme emotional swings. Sometimes. Chronic feelings of emptiness. Sometimes. Explosive anger. No. No. Feeling suspicious or out of touch with reality. Yeah. <laughs> I talk mm. about that all the time. <laughs> I'll let you know what it ends. Uh, the reason I ask is that I am doing my homework and I just needed help with that for a second. No. The nine symptoms of borderline personality disorder. And we'll talk about that much more in length. So do I have it? Because, yes. Because today, (laughs) our book is I Hate You, Don't Leave Me by Gerald Kreisman. Yeah. And Hal Strauss. That's uh, Let's go ahead and talk about that. So while we're listening to the introductory chapter, and I mean we, like in a general sense, You'll be listening to the introductory chapter of this book going, ah, shit. <laughs> it's me, 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 <laughs> me, me. Yeah, the theme no. of this like past week has been me just like having an anxiety attack every couple of hours because I'm just very sure I have borderline personality disorder. Which is one of the symptoms of borderline personality disorder. Which, <laughs> I, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. <clears throat> no, the and the disclaimer that the author has to kind of keep on giving you is like, hey man, we've all got these things. Yeah. We've all got these symptoms. The the issue is severity. Like how much does this interfere with your life? How much does this interfere with your relationships? Because any of these things taken by themselves, this is just normal human behavior. Mm-hmm. When it gets taken to an extreme that's when it crosses over into borderline personality disorder. Hmm. So part of the reason why I wanted to do this book this week is therapy. Yeah. So I'm sitting there in therapy describing the ridiculous experiences that I had during my first marriage and the therapist's eyes are getting wider and wider and wider and at the end of that, yeah, don't you love that? Yes, I'm like oh, I've won therapy. <laughs> Am I the weirdest? Yeah. Did <laughs> did I beat the others this time? And she's like, "Well, I mean, it seems pretty clear to me that your wife was BPD." And I've had a therapist, um, my trauma therapist in Birmingham, and my trauma therapist in Nashville, um, tell me that a former partner of mine. Seems like they might have borderline. I just always took that as like, well, they don't know that person, Mm -hmm. you know, face to face. They just know through what I'm telling them. Right, exactly. And the other part about that is that this is an armchair diagnosis. Yeah. Unless that person comes in to be diagnosed, that's not an official diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It's just speculation. But it seems pretty, it seems pretty clear to her that that was the case. And then once I started reading this book, I was thinking repeatedly like, oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. And For your first wife. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, maybe she's beyond that now. So if one of her friends is listening or if she's listening, 
Who knows if that armchair diagnosis of the way she was at a certain time still applies at all. And the other thing that I think we need to talk about at the very top is like these people are psychopaths to be avoided at all expense, right? Well, actually, <laughs> um, chances are that a decent pie slice of your friends, uh, family, acquaintances, whatever, have this. Mm -hmm. And like I was just saying a second ago, all of us have mild symptoms of this. It just yeah. it depends on how severe it is. This is the most common personality disorder. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like a lot of personality disorders are not diagnosable. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, they are, but like people, like a narcissist is not walking in like, please test me for narcissism. Like, they're not going to do that. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> so, I mean, I think a borderline person is a lot more apt to seek help or at least say they're seeking help. Or to be freaked out at, hey, how come nobody else is freaking out? Yeah, I did not think of my former partner in question um, when I was reading this book. I, I don't know. I don't really think that that matches what I experienced. The The main thing that I got that was kind of the, the most solid thing I got about how to spot uh, borderline personality disorder heretofore known as BPD so that mm -hmm. we don't have to keep on saying it is how uh, disorganized this cluster of yeah. personality issues is and that each individual person will have their own individualized version of it from their own individual experiences because it doesn't seem like this gets this gets, this gets passed along through behavior. This gets passed along through really early childhood trauma or treatment or just learning things wrong. And it doesn't seem to be like passed down genetically. We don't know that for sure. Yeah. But this is there's certain um instances and help me help me remember this because I do not have notes on this. There's certain um, situations and instances in childhood that seem to be responsible for kind of creating a BPD person. Yeah. Remember any I mean, of these? Do you remember that one example? Because like all other of the a lot of the other books we've read, that he has like some cases, some anecdotal um, patients in his writing and remember there was one where it was like uh, a a girl and her mom and her grandmother yes was that did he not say was that more like generational trauma or you know did he feel like that was a genetic predisposition for women in that family yeah this is uh, okay well first off uh since you mentioned women um oh yeah it Used to be thought of as a women's issue. Right. I didn't know that, actually. Like, oh, she's hysterical. And then later on, oh, she's BPD. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, watch out, dudes. Some of your women have this. And really, it's more like it's, it, um, <laughs> it's more of a problem for men when women do it. <laughs> and when men do it, a lot of the time, they'll just wind up in prison. Some <laughs> other behavior will mask this, and it will never occur to anybody like, oh, we should sit them down and try to diagnose what issues they may have. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's just, this guy's an asshole, and he keeps <laughs> on causing trouble? How long can we lock him up for? No, literally, like, the whole time I'm reading this book, and especially with some of the anecdotal information, I was like, so we're just not, we're just, people aren't assholes anymore. <laughs> like, Right, like there's They're an not excuse just for like every it. behavior. There's all. There's got to be. There, everybody's got a diagnosis. It's like you know that that lady uh, just sounds like an asshole. Right. <laughs> like, there's not just like someone who is just like spoilt or you know 
stupid. Yeah, everybody, it, it, it is weird. <laughs> like everybody's got to be the hero of their own story because and they never did anything wrong. These authors do not paint borderline like well. Like no, in a in no. a I say well um in a in a positive light, they do not like act like oh because the whole time I was searching for not for myself honestly but more for the purpose of this podcast I was searching for the part where borderline personality disorder is celebrated or that there's like some positivity or there's some growth. No. And it was just like, no. It no. was like, this sucks. Yeah, it yeah. does suck. So I think uh, any of our listeners with BPD or think they have BPD, and I, I'm saying this based on, like, let's face this, I did, quote, research on YouTube. <laughs> and I'm just trying to get, like, a deeper understanding of, like, what does this look like? You know, yeah. because when I think about it in terms of, like, my ex-wife had this, and this is why she uh relentlessly tortured me for years is she's just an asshole. So what does it look like to the person that has it, you know, who's the hero of their own story? And the answer is that life is fucking scary when you yeah. have BPD. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it just sucks. And when they are trying to, when they're suffering, they'll make other people suffer also to bring them into it. Mm -hmm. And then maybe that person can drag them out of it too. Yeah. But BPDs are seem really reliant on other people. Yeah. The to whole, keep them here in our reality. The quote of people act upon me, therefore I am. Oh, yeah. That was really um, interesting to point out to me. It wasn't just like I'm acting independently of anyone else. And a lot of the book is either anecdotal information about a patient of his with borderline and helping also helping like their family members or partners. And then also instructions on how to deal with your partner. If your partner's diagnosed borderline, but honestly, like it seems like the partners in these situations are putting up with quite a lot. <laughs> and like, I remember I was just like, just, just leave like, man, like dude. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, I know if you really love somebody, I don't know if you really, really do love somebody, that's one thing, but it just seems like you're kind of being asked, as as you would say, to be the grown-up every single time. Yeah. You know, the grown-up mm -hmm. in an argument every single time. Like, you can't lose your cool. You can't have a temper. You can't react. And that's I think that's a little unfair. Part of the solution for this is really that you kind of become their parent. Yeah. Is that fun? Like, no. I don't know. Some personality types will have a complementary disorder mm. where, you know, maybe they need to control people and mm. keep them keep them on the narrow path so that they don't suddenly go off into the weeds or go off into the water and get eaten by alligators and such. Uh, before I guess we get to really any of the, you know, talking about the bullet points, here's our, here's like really the first bullet point. How can others deal with it? And he <laughs> calls it the, uh, setup. So, and the, the set portion of that, um, is support. Mm -hmm. So, th um, that might be like, Hey, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. i I believe that you believe that. Yeah. Uh, empathy. So, you know, sitting with them and like, oh, that sounds really hard. Even though they don't. <laughs> it, yeah, it kind of doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, like it's, yeah. we, we could, I don't know, <laughs> validation just seems to be a big part of it. Yeah. And then part three of that, and it's not part one or two for a reason, is truth. Mm -hmm. So you kind of expose them to like 
you know, I'm, I'm here to support you and I empathize with you, but the truth of the matter is, and that's the, you know, that, but is mm-hmm. kind of important to avoid in, in most relationship drama. Like, you know, you don't want to apologize to somebody by saying like, I'm sorry, I hurt you, but mm-hmm. you was asking for it. <laughs> no, that, so the truth of this situation would have to be, you know, something along the lines of like, but your friends love you. Yeah. You know, or uh, I was there and. Yeah, whatever like, they're freaking out about. I can, see what you yeah. are talking about, but that's not what was going on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I hate that I'm about to say this, but you kind of have to like gaslight them back into reality. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's gaslighting. It is to them. Like true. It feels like it, I'm sure. I don't know. You're like, I, I don't know. Like, I'm panicking about this thing that I feel is very real and you're saying that it's not real. Yeah. I mean, I guess because it's not, I mean, I guess I've been that person several times where I'm just like, this is very real to me. Yeah. And it kind of doesn't matter what y'all think. Yeah. Yeah. This is real to me. This is what I'm panicking about. And that's, that's kind of one of the cruxes. Right. It's a fear really is like kind of a big crux like that. uh, BPDs are, Highly sensitive to yeah. kind of tie it in with the highly sensitive person. Well, and also, like, is it that seems right? that abandonment is a huge trigger. Um, so it seems a lot of anxious attachment. Yes. And that's one thing that I identified with while reading. Or, d- or disorganized attachment, like like me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the let's go back to the nine symptoms and oh, yeah. kind of uh <laughs> kind of get into them because the first one is fear of abandonment. Yeah. And he was thinking, and I I say that, but this is probably based on a lot of research, that this kind of seems to start in the very early days. Like pre-speech where the baby in the in this new world mm-hmm. that it's in is there with uh, the parents and then they're gone and suddenly you're scared you're alone you cry nobody comes back mm-hmm. and for a lot of people this is okay and for some people this is not fucking okay at all mm-hmm. like it, uh, if you if you're a parent that's doing like cry it out sleep method, I guess good luck because some of these kids are going to wind up with borderline. Yeah. <laughs> that apparently is what the books say. That's, you know, I'm, I'm saying that's he a has possibility. Science. He has science. I'm just saying that that seems to be one conclusion that the book is drawing. I am very likely wrong about that. But it seems it seems to start very, very early on. So um, it's and it comes back to object impermanence. Yeah. So when you have object permanence, that's a stage of development where you realize that when mom left your room, she still exists and she's somewhere else. Object impermanence is your mom leaves the room and holy shit, she's gone forever. Mm-hmm. And BPD people will repeatedly call their significant others at work just to make sure that they still exist. Exist? I was okay, so I was wondering about that because is it are you calling your partner at work to know if they still exist or if they're A safe or B still love you? Or off cheating on you. And That's why I'm saying. We'll still love the, you. Yeah, yeah. Like where they they say that they're going to be here, but there's somebody else. Is that what they're that is? Else. Uh, I think we'd have to talk to somebody with BPD, and I think it would depend on the person. Yeah. But some of the people that he was talking about were saying that they were calling because they were literally forgetting their partner. Oh, and, wow. And I, I believe, and we'll come back to this later, <laughs> that my first wife was very much like this. That if I wasn't in front of her, she kind of didn't believe that I liked her, loved her, uh, wanted to be in a relationship with her, or frankly, that it mattered if she was going to cheat on me. But we'll come back uh, to that in another part. So they will beg 
cling, start fights, track their loved one's movements, or even physically block the person from leaving, which I had that happen kind of a lot. Mm. Like I'd be getting ready to go to a show, Mm -hmm. packing up the car, and then we have this incident where the cops may show up. And again, we'll come back to that later. So it's, it's intense fear, intense fear of their significant other, friend, parent, what have you, leaving them, and then they're just screwed. Because them being alone is fucking terrifying. Mm-hmm. Now, we've talked about this. Like, I, while I have consistently been in relationships since I was past puberty, I also like my alone time. Yeah. Like if I'm if I'm <laughs> alone all fucking day, big deal. Right. Bipolar disorder, um, sorry, borderline personality. This is one reason why I need to abbreviate it every right. time because I'll keep on saying that, which is a completely different personality disorder. We'll will actually have like a panic attack because they're alone. Mm-hmm. They cannot take being by themselves. Yeah. Uh second symptom, second sign. Second of nine criteria is unstable relationships. And if you're not with a BPD expert, like one of the people that I found on YouTube that was a, uh, a serial lover of BPD women. Oh, that poor man. (laughs) (laughs) He was, he was interesting. He was interesting. (laughs) And and he he did go on. Uh, People with BPD tend to have relationships that are intense And short-lived. You may fall in love quickly, believing that each new person is the one who will make you feel whole, only to be quickly disappointed. Your relationships either seem to be perfect or horrible without any middle ground. Your lovers, friends, or family members may feel like they have emotional whiplash as a result of your rapid swings from idealization, that's this person's perfect, to devaluation, anger, and hate. Or in other words, this person is absolutely garbage (laughs) And I'm going to discard them, and so should everybody that I know. (laughs) Obviously, this was one of the hallmarks of that first marriage, was that it was extremely unstable. Mm -hmm. And I... But you're also very young. (laughs) Yeah, I was also very young. I I was not... Neither one of us were finished growing up yet. I've had um, some unstable relationships for sure. Name. Name (laughs) one. Just kidding. Don't. Number three is unclear or shifting self-image. I thought this one was really interesting, partly because I've been wrestling with, um, like, what is personality, you know? Who who oh, am right. I, et cetera? Yeah. So um, when you have BPD, your sense of self is typically unstable, and this is why they're going to try to be in relationships and not not be alone at all. Yeah. Sometimes you may feel good about yourself, but other times you hate yourself or even view yourself as evil. You mm. probably don't have a clear idea of who you are or what you want in life. As a result, you may frequently change jobs, friends, lovers, religion, values, goals, or even sexual identity. Hmm. Now, there's plenty of people that do these things. but And if- I think sexual identity is fluid. Sure. It goes back and forth. A lot of this stuff is kind of fluid. I mean, if men start tightening up, acting better, who knows? May (laughs) tilt back in your favor. Um, Number four, impulsive, self-destructive behaviors. If you have BPD, you may engage in harmful, sensation-seeking behaviors, especially when you're upset. You may impulsively spend money you can't afford, Binge eat, drive recklessly, shoplift, engage in risky sex, or overdo it with drugs or alcohol. These risky behaviors may help you feel better in the moment, but they hurt you and those around you over the long term. So obviously I was like super duper excited about this one because this was the the biggest red flag. Right. I feel like I've had experience with someone being um, very impulsive and that would translate into risky sex, mm-hmm. um, gambling, um, drinking, you know, a lot of 
drugs and drinking. And especially, like, in the age of fentanyl, you know? Yeah. Like, stuff like that is very, very scary. Um, For sure. So I think I definitely understand, like, you know, being around someone who has poor impulse control. But I did not know that was a hallmark of BPD. I thought that was more bipolar disorder. Isn't that what this is? Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, this was, this was a big one. This is why I have started going to a sex therapist. Mm-hmm. Is that, uh, you know, aside from that very, you know, first big incident that I talked about in the last episode, there was, a, you know, she slept with all my friends. And it... It, and as as well as like people that I didn't know at all, and it kind of seemed like it was about another person every week for a while. And I, to be clear, she did not have like quote permission to do any of this. It was just something that I <laughs> I had to put up. up. I had to put up with it. <laughs> and if I tried to say no, if I tried to call her out on it, she could become violent. So she would have one of those BPD tantrums, which uh, I think we're we're getting to, but we're not there yet. (laughs) So those two things kind of went hand in hand, right? And I just, again, I I never it never occurred to me that she might be BPD. I didn't know what the fuck her problem was. (laughs) I didn't know she might just be an asshole. She might just be an asshole. But I didn't I didn't know why any of that stuff was happening to me. Not at the time, and I'm still sorting through that now. Mm-hmm. This kind of shows why, like, undiagnosed BPD is damaging to people, mm-hmm. and why also knowing when to recognize it and how to deal deal with it is really important. Which is why we're covering this today. So the fifth one, and and f- a much more familiar behavior is self harm. Yeah. Suicidal behavior and deliberate self-harm is common in people with BPD. Suicidal behavior includes thinking about suicide, making suicidal gestures or threats, or actually attempting uh, suicide. Self-harm encompasses all other attempts to hurt yourself without suicidal intent. Common forms of self-harm include cutting and burning. So, like, you know, we've... a A lot of us have done that. Yeah. But here's the deal. When this is a huge pattern, when this is a cycle, mm-hmm. that's when that's when it it comes into the radar of being like one of the symptoms of BPD. Yeah. If you're constantly using this to control the person that you're in a relationship with, like if you do right. this, I'm going to commit suicide. Mm-hmm. Or if you go to that party, I'm going to commit suicide. Or if you try to break up with me, I'm going to try to commit suicide. Uh, a friend of mine actually accidentally succeeded one time because he was attempting to control his ex. Mm. She comes over a day after she was supposed... He thought that she was coming over on a Wednesday. She got there at the time he thought, except the next day finds him dead. And then she sees, you know, blood all Did over the walls and all that. I, I, I should not laugh. Did he not double check? His ghost is hanging around right now going, I should have put it in my fucking calendar. <laughs> I should not laugh. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, I, better, I, mean, I need a confirmation. <laughs> sorry. Like, I'm really ex- sorry. <laughs> I fuck up my calendar all the time and nobody <laughs> dies usually. Oh, again, sorry to my friend. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> and that's speculation, by the way. I don't know for a fact that that's, oh, okay. you know, maybe he did do it on purpose. But it seemed right. he, had, he had, as a pattern, cut himself 10 minutes before she would arrive so that she would find him in distress, not dead. And it's it's interesting because, you know, people talk about statistics with suicide and men typically will do a more permanent yeah. suicide. They'll do the job. And the cutting is more of a kind mm. of a woman's thing. Yes. Cutting is not done in a half-hearted attempt to commit suicide usually. Normally mm. it would be... Just a release. Yes. And... Yeah. 
it kind of seems like everybody that's done it says, I feel better as soon as I, I do it. I have been pretty open with my experience with self-harm. Um, I have... I I mean, it has been on and off since I was a teenager, um, which my doctor at the time told me to pray about it. It's like, how, okay, How thanks. did that work? Um, prayed really hard. So hard that it's kept on for like a decade. Um, Whoops. No, um, I... Have not I don't I don't keep like calendars or anything like that or like countdowns or anything of since the, it's been zero days since yeah. our last incident. Yeah. Um, but it's been quite a few years since I have self harm. But yeah, it was never a suicide attempt. It was usually just a part of really really low despair and hopelessness and and that just like feeling a release mm -hmm. i feel like there has to be like some kind of like upping upper type of brain chemicals happening too, like e adrenaline hmm. i don't know i mean i don't know i mean i just maybe felt adrenaline like, comes in and like ends the the fogginess or something i mean it was just like just like uh, it's like so so deeply deeply sad and then just like <gasps> you know kind of like a life Back, being breathed back in. Yeah. Um. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also a lot of people say that it can be a sense of control over your own body. Right. Like if you're like if people you're... with eating disorders sometimes say that also. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, I guess it can be a way of regaining control. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Number six: extreme emotional swings. Unstable emotions and moods are common with BPD. One moment you may feel happy and the next despondent. Little things that other people brush off can send you into an emotional tailspin. These mood swings are intense, but they tend to pass fairly quickly, unlike the emotional swings of depression or bipolar disorder, usually lasting just a few minutes or hours. Okay, so when it got to the parenthetical, unlike the emotional swings of depression, mm -hmm. at that point I went, Ah, uh, you know, because a lot of the time, if I, if I'm going to, somebody says something shitty to me mm -hmm. and I've got depression just waiting right here at my shoulder, it's going to go, Hey man, what did they mean by that? <laughs> and that, then I start finding evidence. Uh, like you're talking to me and I'm kind of listening but my brain has gone on a treasure hunt for evidence mm -hmm. that that person that just said the shitty thing about me was right. I'll be lost in that in what I call a spiral mm -hmm. for, let's say, the rest of the day. And then I wake up the next day and I feel the same way. Like I, my mood has failed to reset. The weather in you know, in my body has not changed and I just kind of continue to feel shitty. But so that's, that's what's going to make like me dealing with a person with BPD confused because we might have an interaction and have a big fight. Mm -hmm. And then I see them the next day and they're, Hey man, how you doing? Meanwhile, I'm like, I, uh, I'm not good. Because of what happened, you know? <laughs> so just to be honest, like it, as I'm reading about the conditions that, uh, that will breed people to have BPD, I check a lot of the boxes, but instead of having BPD, I have depression. Okay. So it just manifests in a different way. Chronic feelings of emptiness was number seven. Hmm. People with BPD often talk about feeling empty as if there's a hole or a void inside of them. At the extreme, you may feel as if you're nothing or nobody. Hmm. This feeling is uncomfortable, <laughs> so you may try to fill the void with things like drugs, food, or sex, but nothing feels truly satisfying. My version of this is that a lot of the time I will feel like I'm being treated as though I'm not a real person. Mm -hmm. Again, this is depression. Depression yeah. is looking for evidence that I 
don't belong here so that I will, you know, hopefully stop being here. Uh, it's trying to get me to off myself. But with somebody with BPD, they'll seek to medicate that feeling. Mm -hmm. They'll seek to do it with sex, drugs, rock and roll, what Macaroni have you. Macaroni and cheese. Yeah, oh, yeah. For sure. Macaroni and cheese is actually big in the list of uh, therapies for this. this well, they said food and nothing feels satisfying. Oh, and that's like, right. And I'm like, <laughs> my question is, have you tried mozzarella cheese sticks? Yeah. Hang on. What kind of food? I'm so stupid. I'm talking about those cheese biscuits at, at Lobster. Oh, yeah. Cheese biscuits. Have you tried those? It might fix everything. It might cure your borderline. <laughs> Number eight, explosive anger. If you have BPD, you may struggle with intense anger and a short temper. You may also have trouble controlling yourself once the fuse is lit, yelling, throwing things, or being completely consumed by rage. It's important to note that this anger isn't always directed outwards. You may spend a lot of time feeling angry at yourself. Mm. So this is this is the part that talked about um, BPD tantrums. tantrums. Yeah. yeah. So what I would deal with was hitting, kicking, biting, uh, verbal abuse, and then of course you know the cops would show up and ask her if she was okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, cops. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Nashville police has been doing good work. That's all I'll say. The last year, <laughs> <laughs> they've been on the case. <laughs> and number nine, feeling suspicious or out of touch with reality. People with BPD often struggle with paranoia or suspicious thoughts about others' others' motives. When under stress, you may even lose touch with reality, an experience known as dissociation. You may feel foggy, spaced out, or as if you're outside your own body. Hey, who here, show of hands, has had a dissociative episode? All of us since 2020? Right. I, I, had, I had this because of a, a different ex kind of wallpapering our whole relationship with lies. Mm -hmm. so that once they were removed, I didn't understand the relationship anymore. And this was, you know, six to 12 lies a day for several years. Yeah. Including, you know, what's seemingly her identity and um, just what what our relationship was based on. Um, and when you feel like everything is based on lies, such as when you have paranoia, mm -hmm. your brain is going to get foggy. Your brain is right. going to seek to uh, protect you, and you will have uh, a dissociative experience, mm -hmm. and you may have brain fog, and this is just your brain trying to say, like, would you please sit your ass down? Yeah. I feel Stop like, thinking about this and sit your ass down. I feel like my experience with dissociation was kind of like a trauma response. And I would even say a freeze response, but yeah. it's kind of like a flight response. Yeah. <laughs> um, any, you know, in situations where there's been a lot of yelling or, or high stress, um, violence. Um, yeah. I'm just like, the like you know which is going to make the person even more angry yes <laughs> yeah we actually did hear a lot about like how how to really get into it with somebody with bpd which right. I, I kind of discounted all of that because i know how to do it very well right, right. <laughs> i'm actually interested in the opposite <laughs> Yeah, he has lots of instructions on how to kind of soothe these tantrums, um, mantrums. Um, and then sometimes I'm just like, you could just fucking leave. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like... Most rooms have a door. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, though. Uh, being locked into uh, that relationship, I did not recognize that there was a door. In fact, she left me, first wife, um, after subjecting me to all this shit 
Uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting and really, really resonated was that somebody with BPD will get in a relationship and then dare the other person to reject them. Right. That was the part that really made me kind of identify in previous relationships, just that really angry, mean treatment and then the very like but 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 but, but, but where are you going right. you know <laughs> i'm so sorry yeah like you know let so, me change it or as whatever. the as the recipient of this i get really emotionally hijacked and then when that switch flips i'm so relieved that i have instant amnesia about and yeah you you know you respond with a trauma bond yeah. Because you're expecting that person to then again soothe you. Yeah. Because that's, you know, essentially what you want. You want them to stop being a piece of shit. Please. You know? <laughs> and, you know, their treatment, even though it's short-lived, is to you evidence of that. Yeah. So speaking of treatment. <laughs> There's lots. Yeah. And, um, so this is kind of where it gets to be a lot like the body keeps the score. Is whatever it, do you mean? It's it's just kind of outlining um, all the different types of treatments. It turns into that scene from Forrest Gump, <laughs> where he's listing things that you can do with shrimp. <laughs> but here here are kind of the main ones: bald BPD, barbecued BPD. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> what the hell? Uh, psychotherapy. You know, like if you've been to therapy, mm -hmm. you've been to psychotherapy. If you've been there, psycho. I'm a psycho. Um, and I'm not going to go into that and, and describe what that is because our readers know what psychotherapy is. Right. Readers, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> This is a book club. Oh so, of God. course, I say readers every damn time. Yeah, they're all reading. Right? Di <laughs> no, we are just the suckers reading. We're listening. Oh, yeah. Listen. I think probably there's some uh, pedantic people that will argue that, we know, we're not reading these books. We're listening to them. Um, Kiss my ass. Yeah, exactly. Kiss my ass, <laughs> dumbass. <laughs> DBT, or Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. I didn't know what the fuck this was. Had you heard of it before? I, th I thought DBT was like a drug. It is. It's a very powerful drug oh, to make so you feel wrong. better. So I wasn't wrong. <laughs> no, I think you're thinking of DMT. DMT. Oh, I don't know. And you don't want to do that in the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. Uh, <laughs> there are four components of comprehensive DBT. Skills training group. So this is going to be like therapy in a group setting? What is the abbreviation again? DBT. I mean, yeah, what is the words? D oh, dialectical behavioral Beha therapy. Okay. Okay. Although I guess we could change what the DBT stands for every time. Dick butt titties. I don't ah! know. <laughs> <laughs> There was no no layup there at all. No. <laughs> I just, I just, just wrote, shot a fucking three-pointer. Off the dome. Fuck y'all. Off the dome. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the inventor of DBT is listening to this. Shaking my head. Just angrily writing in. <laughs> um, the next part is individual treatment. So that's going to be a lot more like, you know, our regular one-on-one -on -one therapy. Right. DBT. So if I have borderline, I think I'm. I think I'm already <laughs> suited up to treat. Yeah, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine when we inject you with this uh, personality <laughs> disorder, so you can try it out for a few weeks. <clears throat> Actually, if you want to try this out for a few weeks, have something hugely traumatic happen to you because it, you know, it may result right in borderline. Yeah. Um. Personally. Personality disorders are a lot of times just the presence of trauma in the body. Yeah, it could just That's be how your body responds. Could just be transient and healing. It, mm -hmm. Um, and by the way, while we're on it, like, uh, um, BPD often goes so unrecognized because it will fly under the radar because it pairs really well, like 
a fine wine and some stinky ass cheese <laughs> with other issues <laughs> like depression, for example. Yeah. And they said, uh, like OCD right in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So imagine OCD pairing up with it and how like horrible that would be for the person mm-hmm. and also kind of horrible for the people around the person. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So next part of that is DBT phone coaching. Have you thought about this? Because when he was talking about it in the book, you know, I'm imagining, you know, we, maybe we can text our therapists. Yeah. But this is going to be like, hey, I'm getting activated. What do I do? Yeah. He said that a lot of his patients had pretty poor boundaries. Yes. As far as like, I will like, if I'm emailing my therapist, I'm like, I am so sorry. Right. <laughs> I know how this is supposed to work. I'm having an emergency. <laughs> Get back to me when you can. And right. Three um, days later, they yeah, write back. No, I'm just like, <laughs> if you could possibly, um, I am having a meltdown. <laughs> like, <laughs> and somebody with um, BPD is not. They're just show up in the they're office. They're not going yeah. to be able to behave that way. Which and I've. We're not saying that they should yeah. because they can't. Well, I've had people in. In my life, I wouldn't say they're my friends, just people I've met and talked to who are therapists. And they have said that people with borderline and then also narcissistic personality disorder have a lot of really difficult boundaries with therapy. They'll call at all hours of the night. They'll show up. They'll be text in, you know. Yeah. And, you know, imagine showing up at your therapist's office and throwing a tantrum. <laughs> that can get kind of complicated for the person and their therapist. Right. It might even end therapy. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have to accept that. No, they don't because, you know, boundaries. Yeah, be nice. Damn. And then the the therapist will be perceived as being an asshole because they have boundaries. I'll be like, you're crazy. Bye. And then, and I'm a little foggy. (laughs) So I'm not a therapist. Right. (laughs) Consultation team. So. um, Oh, a conference call. (laughs) Right. <laughs> to talk about all your issues. <laughs> I'm looping in from Canada here. How are your issues today? <laughs> um, and then the other other main way of, uh, main most accepted way of treating this is schema-focused therapy. So schemas are an organized pattern of thought and behavior, a structure of preconceived ideas and behaviors. These usually form when you're very young. Mm -hmm. When these are self-defeating, people need to be reparented, essentially, to become successful. So your worldview might be really incorrect. Mm -hmm. And you march out into the world and everybody hates you because you're acting like an asshole. You know, that's, (laughs) you know, or or you're just fucking yourself up. Mm -hmm. So this kind of seeks to uh to help with that and here's some pretty funky news if you have been listening to this becoming increasingly convinced that you have this at or and or super guilty because of the way we're talking about it sorry medication tends to not help bpd yeah it may treat co-occurring issues such as anxiety and depression though which right. might make focusing on bpd easier for sure yeah but essentially if you have BPD, you need to have, you need to find the right therapist, somebody who's going to have boundaries and not be a pushover and acquiesce to every single one of your demands. Mm-hmm. The boundaries are going to going to be important, and they're not going to get sucked into your world mm-hmm. because that shit can apparently happen. Like some therapists have been drawn into having a sexual relationship Mm. with their, uh, with their BPD um, patient. Just, you know, I I just want to show you closeness. (laughs) It's a sexy situation. It's an extremely sexy situation. (laughs) So what did you kind of feel like you, are going to what's the main shit that you're going to remember from this book Amber? Um I was thinking about that. Um 
I, I mean, it's obviously very informative, but I still feel like kind of unclear on where I could just like be like, oh, this person obviously has borderline. I obviously have borderline, you know, Mm -hmm. like I, I don't, I don't know. It's an, it's an unclear disorder. Yeah. Uh, It's, it's actually overdiagnosed among therapists who just find their patients to be really frustrating (laughs) or an asshole right (laughs) every like person who's just been rude to me i'm like oh do you have borderline (laughs) personality disorder no it's gonna be much more explosive than people are rude and explosive (laughs) sometimes yes um i i'd say that it was really i mean it was very helpful for me to read this bearing in mind like Okay, so I'm not literally the only person that's been through this. Yeah. And maybe I'll know a little bit better about what to do if I'm if I realize that somebody's kind of having a tantrum at me and it doesn't make sense, like there's something that doesn't add up. Yeah. I'll remember set. I just feel like I feel like all the times where I could look back and be like, oh, that was like a really borderline behavior of me. I also feel like is extremely just like immature. I just feel like. That's a common, that's a common criticism. I just feel like as I've gotten older, I've prioritized, you know, more peaceful relationships and uh, more I mean, I guess like a more centered sense of self and I don't know. I mean, I make healthier choices um, and choices is a big part of yeah. what they're trying to work on with yeah. people with BPD. Um, and as far as, you know, if someone, like you said, is just coming at you, I had that situation not too long ago. Someone just like flipping out at me. And I was just like, this is not about me. This seems to be, this is a lot. Yeah. (laughs) From, you know, our brief interaction. So I wish you the best in your healing. (laughs) Like, I didn't walk away from that internalizing it. Yeah. Um, And imagine if I had been able to walk away from the stuff with my first wife without internalizing it. I wouldn't be in therapy for it. Yeah, like, screw her, you know, like, what's her problem? Right. (laughs) Exactly. The ability to not take things personally Mm -hmm. seems like a superpower to me and is one of the main things that I want to work on in 2023. Look at you. Look at me. Look at me. (laughs) See me. I exist, damn it. Um, I think that this is going to be kind of a short episode today. We're we're kind of, uh, right? We're kind of starting to wrap up. So, um I don't know. This book was dry. Yeah. You know, it was... It was it, not my fave. It was dry. Not saying it's not important. No, it's extremely important. It just, you know... Not it's for a, me. It's a dry read. It's not intended to be entertaining. It's intended to be informative. And it is. Kind of. <clears throat> kind of, sort of. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's <laughs> it's confusing because the issue is confusing. Yeah. Um. And I kind of feel like if I were to go back and go through this one more time, God forbid, um, that it would get a little bit less confusing. And I say that because it's, sure. just, it's a lot of information. It's, it's so true, much it's information. It's really long. And um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like super fun to get through as some of our other books, you know, have the, just been really excited. And maybe I just like reading things about myself because um, I'm self-centered. But <laughs> <laughs> I did like the narrator. Yeah. <laughs> the narrator kind of reminded me of LeVar Burton. Oh, he's so cute. Sounded kind of like uh, uh, LeVar has a, a really nice podcast called LeVar Burton Reads. And mm. I kept on <laughs> like sometimes I kind of zone out on the sound of his voice rather than what he was saying. And like <laughs> imagine that it's LeVar Burton just <laughs> listing medications to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, because there's like one chapter where they just list medications. And I was just like, dude, like I told Adam, I was like, you can skip that one. 
And I did. Because I wasn't sure, like, am I going to get the the information, like, eventually? No, not really. I mean. <laughs> no, it's just a list for doctors. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure, like, if I could just, like, skip one part or or what. But, um, yeah, that was boring. Um, <laughs> so if anyone cares <laughs> about my review. Um, what? We had... Um, two books that we were thinking about doing next week. That's right. And I handed it over to my friend Jill to decide for us. Sometimes we'll Did she let... say you could say her name on air? She didn't. <laughs> we're going to bleep that out. No, I'm not going to say her last name. <laughs> we posted her name earlier oh, on Instagram, right. <laughs> so we can't, we can't go that route. Um, but I did hand it over to her since she was such a big champion of our podcast and advertise it to our friends. Um, that was so sweet. I said, hey, bitch, you choose. And um, but she's I, also a librarian. I didn't say bitch, but she is a librarian. <laughs> and so I, you know, take I, that to heart. I tell you, every time I come to her with a book problem or a book question, holy shit, our local librarian, Jill, fucking delivers. Oh, awesome. So since it was such a difficult choice, she broke out like how many people have checked out each book. Oh, that's so She started cool. examining the numbers. What? Like um, the Matrix uh, stuff started streaming across her computer screen. <laughs> uh, and she finally saw through to which one should be the perfect choice. And ultimately, it comes down to timeliness because so many people are thinking about this. Lately, because of the BS that happened in Congress the other day, oh. it's going to be the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Yeah. Which is ultimately something that I need so bad. Sure. I mean, look, I'll teach a class. <laughs> this is where this is where we're really complimentary because I give a fuck and you don't give a fuck. You know, <laughs> I'll teach the damn class. I give a fuck. Like I hate myself. I'm very clear on that. <laughs> but yeah, eh, whatever y'all think, <laughs> it's fine. So thanks to Jill, our listener and my friend, for helping us to solve our little dilemma. And maybe we'll come back to the other book. Oh, for sure. Uh, next. Well, we have next to. semester. Yeah, we have to. So this is going to be our season finale. Full. This right here, right now? No, this upcoming book. Oh, Jesus. You fool, fool. Fuck. Goodness. No, yeah, we've so we've got another episode, the you know, the mm-hmm. uh the gentle art of not giving a, a darn. <laughs> um that'll be the official season finale, and then we've got one after that. Yeah, right? we're gonna do a bonus episode recap. Yeah. Preview. Where we come back to all the books and just see how they've been doing. Uh, How they've since marinated we talked about them. on yeah. our noodles, and just to check in and see where they went in life afterwards. And see like, about the things that we want to look into. Like I really want to look into digital minimalism for the new year. I really oh. want to look into downsizing and organizing. Adam wow. is letting me redo his bathroom. Yes. Um, in the new year. So there are like some other kind of things I definitely want to explore through my own podcast. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> All right, Mamber. Um, will you please give us the socials for today's episode? This one's going to be so- easy. <laughs> so, uh, the second author, Hal Strauss, is on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram as his name, H A L S T R A U S. Yeah, one S. Um, <laughs> Gerald is not on any socials. And I feel like I figured out why. <laughs> did, <laughs> because. Did he get caught cheating? No. <laughs> Well, <laughs> ironically enough, <laughs> maybe. Um, he 
because we were tr- truly really trying to do our research for this one. And we were like watching some YouTube videos and we were watching a video of one of his talks. And one of the people asking this poor man a question, like, kind of railed him. Like, salty as fuck. Like, really kind of just like aggressive there. Yeah. In hey, the, you didn't answer such and such question on and this then you- date. And like on your Patreon video, you said this. And I'm just like, bro, I cannot remember. Like, <laughs> Like, when Facebook freaking kicked me off or, or, no, gave me a warning, I was like, I don't remember commenting men are white trash the worst. I don't know, but I'm sure I did, you know? Yeah, by the way, trash is a trigger word for and, uh, Facebook. But anyway, yeah, so, like, I feel like that was five years ago was that video, and, like, he's not on any social media. Right. So he just, like, probably so, wants so to So I don't know low. what happened. And also, it's very telling that we're reading this book and we're seeking so much supplemental right. information mm-hmm. to help us understand maybe that's the book review right there yeah. but the um I hate you don't leave me what is this third edition yeah if you've got issues 1 or 2 you don't know what the fuck's going on <laughs> Uh, you definitely need to at least look through the third one because yeah. it mentions things like Facebook and you can't, you know, you can't go 10 pages in a book now without mentioning Facebook or Snapchat mm-hmm. or whatever. You got to update it for the kids. I still, I mean. But it's a jumping off point. Who that's over 23 has a Snapchat. It's like 23 year olds and then like 70 year old grandmas on Snapchat with all the freaking eyelash. Somebody yeah. told me. Um, <laughs> filter. I actually got an email earlier today, and I never see my email, but every once in a while, like once or twice a day, I'll get a notification about something in my email. It's never anything that's related to anything that I've been looking out for, but it was like, so-and-so added you on Snapchat, and I was like, I don't have a fucking Snapchat. (laughs) What the fuck are you talking about? You do. (laughs) Um, It got taken away from me because I'm like 44. (laughs) Stop it, <laughs> it's Adam. True. It's revoked. It's like uh, men posting selfies. Um, our Instagram is checking dot in dot podcast on Instagram. And y'all don't forget about bookish. Yeah, our um, book list for all the books that we've covered on this podcast and books we want to read. In the future, are on our link tree on our Instagram profile, and those book sales directly benefit Bookish, which is our local bookstore. And you don't have to go to our local bookstore. Yeah, go to yours. Go to Parnassus in Nashville. Go to Thank You Books in Birmingham. Yeah. Go to Books Are Magic. I don't give a fuck. Just don't go to that guy. Barnes and Nobles. <laughs> no. Oh. You can go to Mr. Barn and Mrs. Nobles if you really have to. I'm talking about Jeff Bezos. Oh, Joe Muggs. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much for spending another uh, chunk of your time with us. I hope that you enjoyed this episode, and we will see you all next week. Bye. Dick butt titties. <laughs>